and show you good morning and good day to people of Trinidad and Tobago. I want to thank the members of the media for coming this morning to our MSJ party office for this media conference. Essentially, we're going to deal with just two issues, but of course we are open to questions from members of the media on any other matter that you may wish to, you may wish to ask about. The two issues that we're going to address this morning is, or are, the sale of Clico being proposed by the central bank with obviously the approval and authority of the Minister of Finance and the Government of Trinidad and Tobago. And secondly, the uh, issue raised by the Minister of Labour with respect to the MSJ's departure from the partnership um, and some uh, very clear um, facts that we wish to put out to the media insofar as that is concerned. So those are the two issues that we will be dealing with this morning. Firstly, the issue of the sale of Clico. We want to state categorically here this morning that we are opposed as a party to the sale of Clico, whether it is to a single investor or to more than one investor, because Clico is currently owned by the people of Trinidad and Tobago as a result of the collapse of CL Financial in 2008 into 2009, uh, which collapse led to a takeover of the assets and liabilities of CL Financial by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Since then, there have been a number of very disturbing uh, decisions by those who have been entrusted with the responsibility to manage the assets of the former CL Financial. Included amongst these decisions which are disturbing have been the sale of a number of companies which in our view uh, were companies that had very significant value and therefore the sale of some of these companies would have resulted in potentially less earnings going forward for CL, the CL Financial Group and therefore potentially a loss of a stream of revenue that would have been ongoing to the government of Trinidad and Tobago and therefore to taxpayers who had to foot the bill for the takeover of CL Financial. So that we have had, for example, recently um, in the public domain announcements with respect to the sale of a number of the real estate assets of CL Financial, such as Val Park, Shopping Center, Atlantic Mall, and so on. We have heard of the um, sale of one of the energy companies of CL Financial, as well as a partly owned um, subsidiary, Angostura, which sold the Jamaican assets that produce Appleton rum and other products out of Jamaica. All of these are disturbing because there's been absolutely no transparency with these sales. In some cases, we have heard after the fact about the sale. In other cases, like in the case of Lascelles de Mercado in Jamaica, um, there was information in the public domain because there were issues as to who would be purchasing and so on. There was a shareholder group or management group in Jamaica that wanted to purchase and there were others that wished to purchase and so on. But in the majority of instances, the sale of assets have taken place uh, without any prior information to the public. We don't know the value, on what basis the assets were valued, whether there were projections for future earnings and so on. Then we come to the original asset of CL Financial. The original asset of CL Financial is Clico, what was the Colonial Life Insurance Company of Trinidad and Tobago, which was started by um, Mr. Dupre. And when he started that in the 1930s, it was the first local insurance company. And therefore, quite apart from the significance of that, has uh, a long traditional history of providing insurance business to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And lo and behold, out of the blue, there was an announcement by the central bank that it has decided to sell the, um, this company, Clico. As a result of that, 
workers, including uh, insurance agents and so on, employed by people, have been given one month's notice saying that their employment will be terminated or is to be terminated at the end of June. A lot of uncertainty is taking place with respect to policy holders and, and persons who have uh, other business with Clico. All of this is extremely unsettling and disturbing. We have absolutely no trust and confidence in this government and indeed in terms of the, in this case, the, the central bank and the governor of the central bank in terms of any sale of government or state assets. We have no confidence because of the way in which they do business. As for example, the initial uh, share purchase IPO with respect to First Citizens. We have all seen the fiasco that that IPO uh, turned out to be. And we made a statement prior to the IPO with First Citizens, which was very clear. We said that there ought not to be um, a sale of First Citizen shares, and in particular, there ought not to have been a sale in that way where individuals could have um, accessed or bought shares, and then a secondary market would be created in those shares. Once you create a secondary market like that, and you allow individuals to buy shares, you're going to get uh, profit making, you're going to get people simply buying to make a profit, and so on, and it encourages a type of, of behavior which is wrong. And we're dealing here now with, with, a, with a very valuable state asset, namely First Citizens. And because of that, the incompetence and ineptitude of the government, the total lack of transparency and accountability, um, quite apart from the fact that Clico represents a very important asset, we are opposed to the sale, and we certainly are calling on the governor, the central bank, and the minister of finance to give proper information to the public. Uh, but also we are saying that this sale must not take place um, for the reasons that we have outlined. So that is the first issue that we wish to address this morning. The second issue relates to the statement made by the Minister of Labor at the post-Cabinet press conference briefing on um, Thursday afternoon. And at that press conference, he stated that um, I had a meeting with him about a week or so prior to our departure as MSG from the People's Partnership, both as a coalition of parties as well as from the government. Um, and then alluded to the fact that I had come to him to seek his assistance with trying to have uh, persons in the party change their mind about departing from the government. I want to say ca categorically that that is not so, that is not true whatsoever. I did have a meeting with him. In fact, it was not the first meeting that I had had with him. As you know, Mr. McLeod voluntarily gave up the leadership of the MSJ in January of 2012. And I was asked by the party activists to assume the responsibility as leader of the party subsequent to January of 2012. After that, Mr. McLeod attended um, no activist council meetings. I'm not sure if he attended any executive meetings, perhaps one if, if for the most, after January of 2012. It therefore meant that in March of 2012, when the party began to discuss the issue of our relationship um, publicly, because we put out a public statement in March of 2012, publicly about our relationship with the partnership, uh, Mr. McLeod was not present at that or any subsequent meetings. And as you are aware, we made three statements, one in March, one in May, just before the second anniversary of the partnership. Um, and then we made a third on the 16th or 17th of June, which was the date on which we announced our departure from the, from the partnership. Um, at none of those meetings was Mr. McLeod present. And therefore, it was necessary for me as political leader to discuss with him, because he was a member of the executive, although he had not been attending meetings, he was a member of the executive, um, and he was um, a minister of government, member of parliament, and so on. It was necessary for me to brief him um, as to what was transpiring at the level of the executive and the activist council, so that he would have an understanding um, of the dynamic of the discussion that was taking place in the party at that time. 
I also want to say that in March of 2012, when we made our first statement, was not the first occasion on which the party leadership had begun to discuss um, the coalition and the dynamic of the coalition. That had been an ongoing discussion for a considerable part of 2011, and more particularly following the state of emergency that was declared in August of 2011. Um, and in fact, sometime after that, the party leadership had a major um, assessment of our relationship with the government and with the coalition and so on. And we um, had decided way back in 2011 that we had to begin to prepare for the situation where it was no longer tenable for us to remain in the partnership because we saw all the signs um, in 2011 that it would become untenable at some point in time or the other for us to remain in the partnership. When that moment uh, was, we of course did not know in 2011, but we were very certain in our minds that given the direction of the partnership, it would become untenable at some point in time or the other, and that we had to begin to prepare for that. Um, so Mr. McLeod was well aware of the fact that at some point in time, um, it would have become necessary for us to have left the partnership. I want to say that um, Prior to our uh, decision not to attend the second anniversary rally, um, which would have taken place on the 24th of May 2012, I indicated to Mr. McLeod that this was the thinking of the party, that we would not attend the rally and so on. He had been listed, I believe, to speak at that rally. And we had a discussion about that, and I urged him not to attend because he was still a member of the party executive. Um, I urged him not to attend and to therefore stick with the party on this one and to indicate by his non-attendance that he was expressing um, unity with the party um, and disagreeing with the direction that the government was going in. Um, he obviously um, did not agree with that and went ahead and spoke at that rally on the 24th of May, and I'm sure you could go back to the media clips and see that. But we made a categorically clear statement about why we would not be attending the second anniversary rally, and we made that statement very publicly as well. We did meet again for the last time um, about a week prior to our decision to leave the partnership. Um, he was due to travel out of the country to attend ILO meetings in Geneva um, a day or two after our meeting and was not due back in the country before um, we actually took the decision to leave. And I indicated to him what the seeming consensus at that time was and the direction that the party was going in with respect to the partnership and that an announcement was um, likely to be made prior to June 19th. We have not yet formalized the details and so on, but I indicated to him that it was likely that we would make an announcement prior to June 19th. I did share with him, um, and that is not for the public, I did share with him you know, the dynamic and the various um, debates that were taking place, in fairness to him as a member of the executive, um, the various debates that were taking place within the party, but that at the end of the day, the decision of the party would be a united decision, whatever it was, um, would be a totally united decision of the party, as it was when we decided it was a unanimous decision by the members of the executive and activist council as to how we should, or what we should say, and what we will be doing, um, and how we would announce it on the um, just prior to, to the 19th of June. So um, that was the nature of our discussion. I did not request his support um, to convince or, 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 or try to um, discuss the matter with any member of the party executive or activist council. I did not seek his support for any of that. 
I simply went to share with him, as I thought was necessary, given that he was Minister of Government, elected on the basis of the MSG, to indicate to him what the position of the party was. Okay? And that's what I want to say. Let me just add, let me just add one other point, which I think is necessary. It's very interesting that um, Mr. McLeod has not responded to what is really a more fundamental issue um, the, the fun issue about a meeting between himself and myself really is not fundamental. What is far more fundamental is whether or not, as a member of the MSJ going into the government in 2010, he achieved the mandate which we had given him going into that position as Minister of Labour, which mandate was the implementation of major reform of the labor environment, in particular major reform of labor legislation, and therefore cre creating an, an environment um, that would enable workers to enjoy fully the right to freedom of association and enable trade unions to enjoy fully the right to free collective bargaining and to ensure that the balance between capital and labor was brought back more to the middle ground. Um, and I say that because in 1965, when the Industrial Stabilization Act was passed, the Court of Appeal of Trinidad and Tobago, led by the then Chief Justice Sir Hugh Wooding, in a judgment with respect to Abraham and Collymore, two oil workers from Point of Pair, who legally challenged the constitutionality of the Industrial Stabilization Act. When um, the, it went before the Court of Appeal, the then Chief Justice Sir Hugh Wooding said that the pendulum had swung too far in favor of workers and trade unions, and the pendulum had to be brought back somewhere in the middle. And that is why they upheld, one of the reasons why they upheld the um, decision of the High Court that ruled in favor of the government and against Abraham and Colimo and said that the ISA should stand on the law books of Trinidad and Tobago. We have seen since 1965 and then subsequently 1972, um, when the Industrial Relations Act was passed, that the pendulum has really gone way over in favor of the employers in terms of the rights of workers to join a trade union um, and the rights of trade unions to engage in free collective bargaining. And therefore, the pendulum had to come back into the middle. And Minister McLeod, as Minister of Labor, had that responsibility on behalf of MSJ and on behalf of the labor movement to reform labor legislation to achieve that. Um, and he has um, failed very significantly in that regard. That is a substantive issue which he has not addressed whatsoever. Okay, we open to questions. Well, first of all, I did not ever say that I was forced. So that is a, that is a false statement. Um, I was not forced whatsoever into making any decision. If I felt that I was being forced against my will, then I would not be political leader of the MSG because I would not you know, be forced into a situation like that. I would do the honorable thing and step down and allow somebody else to lead the party. Um, so no, I was not forced and that is not a correct statement. It's well known um, that the decision, as I just said, was a unanimous decision. I myself drafted and wrote all three statements that were made by the party, the one in March of 2012, the one in May of 2012, the one in June of 2012. That was all my, my work, all of my creative ideas uh, went into those three statements. Um, and then as a draft brought to the executive and activist council and other people made some inputs and so on. But essentially all of that was my thinking. Um, and I wouldn't write something and put it, well, put it down in paper and write something that I personally do not believe in. I could say this, just to elaborate, that the party could not simply withdraw without a process of, of engaging with the other coalition partners on the one hand 
and involving the people of Trinidad and Tobago at, on the other hand. Um, and that is why we made, it was a three-step process. Statement in March, which said if by the second anniversary certain things were not done or we listed those issues, then we would have to seriously um, reevaluate our position within the government. And on the second anniversary, just prior to that, most of the issues that we identified had not been addressed by the partnership, so we withdrew our members from the state boards, if you remember, and we made an even stronger statement. And we said we were not taking part in the second anniversary rally. Um, and then a month after that, or three, three and a half weeks after that, we announced our departure because none of the issues that we had put on the table had been satisfactorily addressed by the other members of the coalition and we departed. So it was a three-step process um, that we engaged in, and I thought we should just remind ourselves and the country of that. Well, he said he had been asked by the Prime Minister to speak, and he felt that as a member of cabinet he was obligated. My response to that was that the anniversary was not an anniversary of the government. It was not a government activity, though we don't know what money was spent, whether it was government money or otherwise, but it was, was supposed to be an anniversary of the partnership as a coalition of parties, um, and that in that situation he was not obligated whatsoever to any cabinet you know, obligation to the prime minister. And that therefore, as a party, he ought, as a party member, he ought to stick with the unity of the party on this question. Thank you, Mr. Mutaba, and your time for your next process. Ask you to rethink the decision of the All right, I don't want to go into all of the details. He expressed his views about whether we should be in or out. Um, I expressed what the views were of party members at the level of the activists and at the level of the executive. So I indicated what the different thinking that was taking place at the time in the party. Um, the, the, the thing is that, that Mr. McLeod had the opportunity to attend party meetings and to come to the executive and to the activists and to state his views in, that, in those forums. Um, he chose not to. Um, but I, I said I felt obligated to uh, share with him, and he shared with me his views and, and so on. Um, and it's not necessary to indicate what everybody's views were. And I think the important thing is that there was a forum, a democratic forum within the party, which in accordance with the Constitution and the Code of Conduct of the party, there's the democratic forums, the activist council and the executive, at which views are expressed openly and frankly, pros and cons, people give arguments and reasons, and so on, why? And at the end of the day, we come to a unity on the question. And essentially, we don't have to take a vote on it, because at the end of the day, we seek to arrive at a unity based on, on all of the discussions. And that is how we, we have proceeded in the party on the basis of developing the unity out of a consideration of all of the views of everyone who is entitled to give those views. And so I would have reported back to the executive what Mr. McLeod's views were. Though, as I said, he ought to have come to the meetings to express it directly. But I would have reported what those views were. And hopefully I reported faithfully and accurately. As far as we are concerned, Mr. McLeod is not a member of the MSJ. Um, according to the Constitution, of course, he has absented himself completely from all the activities of the party from 2012, so for all intents and purposes, he's not a member of the party. He doesn't speak on our behalf, he doesn't represent the party in the government, um, and has not done so from, from 2012. Somebody was sorry, sorry. Yes, well. 
Yes, my, my, my activist members are, are, are saying um, that for the record, of course, he was not the founder of the MSJ either. He was the interim chair of the MSJ when he started in, in 20... For the second. Okay. Yes, all right, let me start again. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, the, the, it has often been projected that Mr. McLeod was the founder of the MSJ. That is not so. He, when we started off in 2010, um, he was the interim chair of the party because we did not have a constituted structure. So we had, I think, three, three positions. One was an interim chair, one was a coordinating secretary, and one was an interim treasurer. I think those were the only three positions that we had. We didn't have a fully constituted executive. We had a working committee of, of the party at the time. And so when it came to signing the Faisabad Declaration, we had to have one of the three officials of the party at the time signing, and, and obviously it was the interim chair who would have, have signed the, the Faisabad Declaration on the 21st of April. And, and so that, that um, went on, and then he was elected the political leader at our Congress in May of 2011. But um, it's not correct to say that he was the founding father. Um, I'm not going to speak about that today. That's not important. When the history of the MSJ is written, all, all of the facts will be correctly recorded. But are you all surprised that he stood up here and say he no, because when you seek to defend the indefensible, then you get into all kinds of trouble. Um, and therefore, the, what is indefensible is the failure to implement the reform of labor legislation. There was a worker's agenda that had been approved by a joint consul board, which he was a member and spoke at, on the um, 18th of April, 2010. And the, the, the workers' agenda was, of course, a very long, detailed document. It didn't only deal with trade union or industrial relations or labor matters. It dealt with governance issues. It dealt with education and health and a very wide range of issues. Um, however, the spe very specific mandate which we had, uh, both as the labor movement, but more particularly this morning speaking as MSJ, for the Minister of Labor was the implementation of the reform of the industrial relations landscape and the reform of labor legislation in particular. That was a very specific agenda and four years have passed and very, very little. The, the minor, minor ones have been tackled. The major ones of greater importance have not been attempted whatsoever. Okay. So, so, so Mr. McLeod represent who in the parliament? You have to ask him that. He represents in the parliament, he represents in the parliament the constituency of point of pair. Okay. In terms of the... You have to ask him that. He certainly does not represent the MSG. You will have to ask him what his party relationship is. Okay. All right. Is there anywhere you all could do any extra like the same thing? Sorry? Is there anywhere the MSG could keep a staff to expel him from the party? Well, as far as we are concerned, as I said, that he's no longer a member or because he has not functioned as part of the Executive or Activist Council for the last um, two years. No, but is there something more like time membership? No, 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 no. There's nothing like that in our constitution. No, constitution. Yeah. There's nothing like that in our constitution. So once you absent yourself for a particular period of time, then you cease to be a member. Could you propose a by-election for having it there? Replace where? You went up for your party in his, his constituency. That, that is not for us as a party to deal with. That is now for the parliament, because that now falls under the, the um, electoral laws of the country and also the issue of, of persons sitting as members of parliament. That is not now for us as a party to deal with. If there was a process of a right of recall, as had been proposed and agreed to in the manifesto of the partnership, then the constituents of Point of Pair could have taken that course if they wished. That would be up to them. 
not to us as a party to initiate a right of recall, but to the electors in, in a constituency. But that doesn't fall on, a, on us at all. No, that's not our responsibility. 